And um, let's turn to Revelation chapter 1, shall we, this morning? And just want to um, share for a little bit the thing that's on my heart for the next season. Um, you know, we've been talking about the favour of God. And, um, you know, the favour of God is what the kingdom of God is about. We live in the favour of our king. And um, but, uh, we're going to focus on living the kingdom way. You know, there's so many uh, ways we can live what has been called a Christian life. Um, you know, and churches have all kinds of different concepts, different types of churches, of uh, what it means to be a Christian, how to, how to live as a Christian. Also, there's many different, you know, worship styles and, uh, and so on. And, um, but, uh, you know, the Bible is very clear about um, uh, this life that we, to, that we have the privilege of living in the kingdom of God. And um, it might seem like a strange place to go to, um, to start a series on living the kingdom way. But um, let's read Revelation chapter 1 from verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the sake of the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And then let's jump over to to verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And I think I'll leave it there, because I don't want to get caught up in in the... um, the stuff, all the imagery to do with the lampstands and, and all of those kind of things because that's not that, um, our subject today. But you know, the, the, the thing about this is that um, John's on the Isle of Patmos. He's exiled and um, he's in isolation. He's not with the people he loves. He's, um, in fact, he's living in a cave. That's what history tells us. So here's a guy who's living on an island in a cave and he's in exile And this is what he says when he writes this this letter. He says, I'm your brother. But he says, I'm your companion, firstly in tribulation. So he's being realistic. He's he's not living in denial. He's saying, yep, there's tribulation. You guys are experiencing it. I'm experiencing it. But we're companions together in this. In other words, the tribulation hasn't separated them as far as their love for one another or hasn't broken their relationship. It hasn't severed their covenant, you know. Um, They're companions in tribulation, but fortunately he doesn't stop there. Wouldn't it be terrible if he stopped there? Well, we're companions in tribulation. If that was all it is, then there's not a lot of hope here. But he goes on, he says, we're also, I'm your brother and I'm your companion in the kingdom of God. Which suddenly changes the whole equation. Because the kingdom of God is is about the the king. Because without a king, you don't have a kingdom. And without a kingdom, there's no king. And so a king in exile really is not a king because they're not ruling a kingdom. And so they might have the title or they might might have the lineage, but unless they actually have a kingdom and can rule that kingdom, they're, they're actually not functioning as a king. And so Jesus is the king of this kingdom. And it says here that Uh, John says, I'm your brother and companion in the kingdom. The difference between Jesus' kingdom and every other kingdom is that he has all authority. Not just the authority of an earthly king over a, a certain sphere on this planet, but he has authority over the whole planet. He is Lord over all. Not only that, but he has all power. You know, we started this morning singing, Through you... I can do all things. And of course we know Paul wrote that to the Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ means anointed one. But that's not anointed as in what we call the feeling of the anointing. That's not what the scripture is talking about at all when it talks about the anointing. To be anointed means to be set apart for a purpose. And so when Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he was saying, he was really alluding to who Jesus was anointed to be. And he was anointed to be the king of the kingdom. He was anointed to be Lord over all. And so if, if we can, uh, we don't have the same mindset, I should say, as what the New Testament church had. 
Because when they said Christ, this was the context that they understood it in. Whereas I think sometimes for us, Christ is like Jesus' surname. His title is Lord, his first name is Jesus, and his surname is Christ. That's kind of how we use the terminology. Is that, is that fair to say? You know, Lord Jesus Christ. And, but it's because we haven't really been taught, firstly, what the words mean, and we haven't been fully taught who he is. He's more than saviour. He's more than healer. He's more than deliverer. He is more than the one who blesses. All of those things actually flow out of who he is and out of the fact that he has all authority, he has all power, he is the king over the kingdom of heaven which he brought here to planet earth and because he's the king then he provides salvation. He brings us out of darkness into light. He brings us out of those other kingdoms as Jew is sharing around communion into his kingdom. And so John is in, in, uh, on the Isle of Patmos, he's in exile, he's in isolation, he's living in a cave and he says, I'm your brother, I'm your companion, yes there's tribulation but we're in a kingdom that transcends all of this. Isn't that good? And then the third thing he says is, I'm your brother and companion in patience because we need patience in the midst of tribulation, to see the kingdom manifest. And it's interesting that he puts these three things together. There's such a balance here, isn't there? You know, there is the stuff of life, but it has to be processed through an understanding of the kingdom of God, which we are members of, and then we need to, to understand the, the process of how to transition from being in tribulation to actually understanding how to live in the kingdom, whether there's tribulation or otherwise. Yeah? And what a joy it is to be in the kingdom of God. I'm so grateful to God that, that he has, over the last, I don't know, 12, 15 years, been talking to me about his kingdom and revealing his kingdom because I want to tell you something. Jesus' message was his kingdom. If you read through and start looking for uh, all the stuff it says about the kingdom, Jesus' whole message was about his kingdom. And you know what? Salvation takes on greater impact for us if we understand it in the light of the kingdom. Deliverance, healing, his blessing, all of the, the, the benefits, they take on greater impact. And there's, I know for me there's greater faith for these things to, to manifest in my life as a result of having revelation of the kingdom and understanding them in the context of the kingdom. Do you know the, the, the church changes when we uh, do church in the context of the kingdom? Because if we're just doing church because that, and doing the things that we've always done because that's how church is, then we have to find reasons why we do those things sometimes. Or we just end up being religious. And doing things because, well, this is what we do. But in the kingdom, and with a kingdom understanding and a kingdom context, then everything has a reason. Everything we do will have a, a, you know, a reason for its existence. Everything that he asks us to do, we'll be able to understand it differently when we get a uh, you know, greater revelation of the kingdom of God. And here's John, and he's on the Isle of Patmos, and he's not bemoaning his fate. He's saying, I'm your brother. I'm your companion. We're still connected. You're not here with me, but we're still heart to heart connected. And yes, there's tribulation, but we're a part of this great kingdom and we are going to be patient. And, and, uh, and of course, the balance in patience is faith. Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises, the writer to the Hebrew says. And so if we are patient, it's with faith in our hearts. Why? Because we're a part of a kingdom whose king is able to deliver us from all things whose king is able to heal every disease, whose king is able to save even the worst person. We're in a kingdom whose king is able to change any and every circumstance. Isn't that good? He doesn't do it always when we want it to happen. He doesn't always do it how we want it to happen. That's why patience is in the list here. But through faith and patience we inherit the promises. Isn't that good? And so living the kingdom way is totally different from living the world's way. 
Because this kingdom is contrary to the world we live in. And so I want to I um, pose three questions this morning about living the kingdom way. And really I'm talking about living in the spirit. So the first one is, how do I live? How do I live? And so obviously I've couched it that way so that you'll ask that question of yourself. <laughs> how do I live? Here in verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So again, he's saying the Lord's day. He's alluding to who it is. Because in the, in the Bible, the, the, um, the word that is tra- translated Lord is actually more effectively translated king because it means the same thing. It, it's all about supreme in authority. And so I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. For the sake of what I'm trying to communicate today, I'm going to say I was in the spirit on the king's day. That puts a little bit of a different thing on it for us, doesn't it? Because the Lord's day, we just kind of go, oh yeah, Sunday, church, the Lord's day. Because it's about the connotations we have on words. But if we say, which you can more than reasonably translate this as king, John's there on the Isle of Patmos and he says, I was in the spirit on the king's day. This day I am honouring my king in the midst of my tribulation. And how I'm honouring him is I'm living the way you do in the kingdom, which is I'm in the spirit. So how do I live? Do I live in the spirit? That's really the, the question, isn't it? Do I live in the spirit? He says, I was in the spirit. I was not in the flesh. I was not filled with negativity. I was not filled with unbelief. You know, I was not filled with doubt and fear. I was in the spirit. And when you think about the fact that he was in exile, living in a cave, that's a great statement, isn't it? What a great confession. Because he understood the kingdom. You see, when we understand the kingdom, then circumstances don't have the same impact on our lives because we have a revelation and a perspective that transcends our circumstances and that causes us to interpret our circumstances completely differently. Yeah? And um, so I wonder if we could go over to Romans 8 and um, all the um, theologians in the house are probably not surprised at all that I'm going there if we're talking about living in the spirit. In Romans 8, and I'm going to start from verse 5 of Romans 8, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. So how do we live in the spirit? It's by how we set our minds. It's a mindset. If we have the right mindset, we actually release the Holy Spirit to be who he is in and through our lives. That's got nothing to do with how you felt when you woke up this morning. (laughs) It's got nothing to do with whether you are feeling healthy or otherwise. It's actually even got nothing to do with what the doctor has to say. Yeah. Yeah. As, as most of you know, you know, Judy had major surgery earlier this year and um, of course she's not here today because uh, grandbaby number seven is probably coming today and so uh, you know, she's somewhere else <laughs> as uh, grandmothers tend to be. But um, you know, the, um, the thing is that we, we had a choice. We could either believe what the first prognosis was or we could be in the spirit. So the pr- first prognosis was a uh, 25 millimeter tumor inside the spinal column. So if you believe that, <laughs> does that inspire faith? Absolutely not. But we live in a kingdom where our king is greater than that. But then we had a choice. Do we believe for the power of God to simply heal? Or do we go through the process medically? And some people may not understand this. I'm a person who believes for instant healing every time I pray for somebody. But God has various ways of dealing with things. And we felt that God was saying to us that we needed to go through the process. 
And you know what? I've, I've learnt so much going through the process this time. Because what ended up happening, of course, is it wasn't a tumour, it was a cyst. We've been able to share the Lord with the neurosurgeon. Been able to share about the Lord with his nurse. It's, the testimony has just been incredible because we went through what other people go through, but we had faith in our hearts. We had absolute confidence. And they're showing us all the MRIs and whatever, and here's the problem, and this, and you know, there's a blood vessel into here, and you know, and if we touch that, well, you could die, and you know, and if we hit a wrong nerve, hit a nerve, you could die, and you know, isn't it great when they say you could die, and then you could die? <laughs> but we live in a kingdom where we have a choice, and we can choose to be in the spirit. Isn't that good? And I know some of you, you here today, are facing stuff you know, physically, you know, where you need healing. But you know what? The first choice is not to believe for healing. The first choice is to be in the spirit. Because this is a spiritual kingdom. And the Holy Spirit was sent to be someone just like Jesus to us, another one the same as, John said. And he's the governor of the kingdom. He rules in our hearts, or that's his job, is to rule in our hearts and rule in our lives because Jesus is not here in the flesh. He sent the Holy Spirit. And what a great thing. We don't have to charge around the world trying to find that one person, Jesus, in the flesh. <laughs> but he sent the Holy Spirit who indwells all of us. Wow. And so he's like the governor. So the king's back at home base in heaven. And just like the, you know, our monarch is in England and we have a governor of Australia, do you know it, it's the same sort of picture? The Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom. And if we will acknowledge him for who he is and allow him to be who he actually is in our lives, then we can live in the spirit even if we're actually stuck in a cave exiled on an island. Because if we live in the spirit, everything else changes. Our perception changes. Our attitudes change. Our decisions change. Everything changes if we're in the spirit, no matter what the circumstances. It's good, isn't it? Is this, is this doing you good this morning? I hope it is. Because, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, Jesus said. In other words, stuff happens to us all. Except that we're in a kingdom that's not of this world. And the king has sent the Holy Spirit so that we can be in the spirit, we can be led by the spirit, we can walk in the spirit, we can live in the spirit, and do life totally differently from how we used to. Number two question, who's leading me? Who is leading me? You know, he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a voice. And in fact, the voice was behind him. This is in Revelation 1 and verse 10. And the, it was a loud voice and it was like a trumpet. Now, I've, I've heard some loud voices at times. I've been loud at times. <laughs> but this voice was loud, but it was like a trumpet blast. And it got his attention. Later on it says, and I turned to see. So this voice got his attention. In other words, suddenly he was not just in the spirit, but he was being led by the spirit. He heard this voice and it caused, caused him to turn. So what is leading us? What voice is the strongest voice in us? Do you know we've had a change of voice in Canberra? And all of a sudden the poles are up. I, I've got to tell you, I'm not listening to that voice. Because <laughs> God's got some other strategies for our nation that that voice hasn't heard yet. <laughs> and then, the, then there's the voices of all the lobby groups who all have their own agenda and want their own way. You know, and those voices are actually reshaping our society. And unfortunately, because we're not talking about those issues enough, they're reshaping the church. Sometimes away from what the Word of God says. So what are we being led by? Who's leading us? Are the voices in, in the political arena leading us? Are the voices of the, the lobby groups leading us? Are the voices that are reshaping our education system leading us? 
Are the voices that say the economy is down, everything's bad, it's getting worse, is, are these the voices that are leading us? We live in a kingdom that transcends these things. And so we need to be hearing the voice of the king. And if we're in the spirit, then we will hear the voice of the spirit in our hearts. If we're in the spirit, acknowledging him in our lives, acknowledging the lordship of Christ in us, then we are going to hear his voice and he's going to say a whole lot of different things from what the politicians are saying. He's going to say a whole lot of different things from what the lobby groups are saying. He'll say a whole lot of different things from what the economists are saying. He'll say a whole lot of different things from what all the social commentators are saying. And he will give us words of life. Yeah? He'll give us words of life. He will speak into our heart things that will cause us to see through what's happening around about us and to see beyond it and to see his will and plan and purpose, his way, so that even if we're in a cave exiled on an island, we'll be able to say, man, I'm your companion, I'm your brother. We're in this together. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> yeah. E even in tribulation, he had an encounter with Jesus. Isn't that good? He had an encounter with Jesus. And so the king was leading him whether he was with all the churches and enjoying their fellowship and so on and everything going great, or whether he was on the Isle of Patmos living in a cave, he lived in the Spirit and he was led by the Spirit. And um, let's go to Galatians chapter 5 to just have a look at what Paul said there to the church in Galatia about being led by the Spirit. Just didn't look right, and then I realized I was in Ephesians. <laughs> All right, Galatians 5, verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Do you know, the, battle, the greatest battle is between the Spirit and the flesh, but if we are living in the Spirit, then we can be led by the Spirit. Yeah? Yeah? If we're listening to his voice, he'll lead us in spiritual ways. And so Paul said to the Romans, it's about how we set our minds. And then he says to these guys, walk this out. Walk in the spirit. And if we're led by him, then we can walk this out. But, you know, he says that there's this, this lusting that goes on. Now, the word lust for us has the connotation that is mainly sensual and sexual. Isn't that true? But it means craving. So you can lust after chocolate because that's actually what the word means. If you have a craving for chocolate, you're lusting after it. So we've put this connotation on the word lust, but actually we've limited what it means. What it's saying here is that the flesh craves attention. The flesh craves expression. That, that's really what it means. But if we're living in the spirit and we're listening to the voice of the Spirit, then we can walk in the Spirit and the flesh doesn't have its way in our lives. Isn't that good? So then what are the areas of the flesh if it's not just sensual and sexual? Well, I think fear is a, a big one. Fear is not just irrational, it's insatiable. True? And if we feed fear... Man, it just controls and dominates our lives and can end up making us crazy. So that's an example of something that lusts against the spirit. Because we're not, you know, Paul said to Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear. Why? Because we live and walk in, in the spirit. We are people of a spiritual kingdom that's not of this world. And so therefore, he would not give us a spirit of fear that's the part of the flesh that craves attention in our lives and craves to dominate, but instead we've been given a spirit of power and love and soundness of mind. John's on the Isle of Patmos, he could have gone nuts there, but instead he's clear in his mind, he gets the greatest set of revelation that, that uh, I think humankind has ever known, which is you know, 
uh, you know, rolled out in the book of Revelation. And, um, and, and Jesus speaks to him about the church and, and about worship and about what heaven's like and all kinds of things. This guy is in, he's in exile and living in a cave, but he's in the spirit. Yeah, he's in the spirit. So therefore he hears a voice. And it's the voice of a spirit person. Because Jesus was no longer on earth in the flesh. Yeah? And so he is led by the spirit. And if we're led by the spirit, we therefore walk in the spirit and we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Do you know, in different seasons of life, there are different things that, that lust for attention. Or You know what I'm saying? I know that since I've been in my 50s, there's this thing inside me that wants to settle down. And I'm fighting it. <laughs> I think I'm probably more balanced than I've ever been in my life, but I don't want to lose the passion. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to just settle into being comfortable because it would be so easy to do so. Yeah? Because that's what I found for me in my 50s. So I'm thinking, well, when I'm in my 60s, it's probably going to be even worse. When I'm in my 70s, it'll be an even greater thing lusting in my life. Lusting for comfortableness. Lusting for ease. Lusting to, you know. Now, yeah, we need to have an ease in our spirit and do things out of the flow of the spirit. But, you know, I don't want to ever retire. There are changes of seasons and the day's going to come where I won't be doing some of the things I'm doing now, but... I don't want to call it retirement. I want to still have the flow of the Spirit in my life. I want to still be bearing fruit in the kingdom. You hear what I'm saying this morning? You know? Whereas if these things that crave attention in the flesh, because the older we get, the more we have, you know, there's different things that we start to feel. <laughs> and some of you are much older than me, and so you know about stuff that I'm yet to discover. Makes me feel like a teenager. <laughs> but you're hearing the, you understand the principle of what I'm saying this morning. So then that means that in every season there are things that we could just accept and go, oh, well, you know. Or that we can say, well, is this about the life in the spirit or not? And if, if we don't ask that question... If we don't ask if we're being led by the Spirit in this thing, we can just simply slide into a lifestyle that may be more about the flesh than about the Spirit. John's situation was very blatant, wasn't it? You know, he's on an island, he's in exile, he's living in a cave. And so therefore it's like, well, okay, I've got some choices to make. But when it's a process that just gradually happens... Sometimes we cannot see the change we've gone through and how we've perhaps given in to some stuff or just allow certain things to creep in unless we stop and ask ourselves some questions like, how do I live? Am I living in the Spirit? And who is leading me? Am I truly being led by the Spirit? Because in the kingdom, that's how we live. And so therefore, it means that we may not have the same physical energy that we once had, but we can still have the same fire inside. Yeah, We can still have the same passion, still have the same life flow, still have the same desire to see God do great things. Why? Because that's what the Holy Spirit's going to stir in us. He's going to stir that stuff in us. All right, number three, what am I like? What am I like? So this is the third question that I'd like to, you to ask yourself. What am I like? In verse 17 in Revelation 1, John says, when I saw him, so he turned to see the voice because he knew it wasn't just a, a flesh and blood voice. But when I saw him, so Jesus manifested himself, he says, I fell at his feet as dead. He said, I was like a dead man. Like a dead man. Do you know the kingdom of God is about dead people? <laughs> now I've got your attention. <laughs> But it's true. The kingdom of God is about dead people. 
people who are dead to sin, dead to the flesh, dead to their own wants and desires and all that kind of stuff. People who have encountered Jesus in a way that stuff dies. And, you know, if something's died, then it can't have any influence anymore. Is that true? Yeah. I remember when I was um, about um, seven or eight years old, we had a dog. This was in Papua New Guinea, and um, this dog disappeared for a while. And uh, then we heard a report after some weeks that it was in a, a particular village. So my dad went out there to bring the dog back. The only trouble is that when he got there, he found that it had rabies. <laughs> so he didn't want to do anything in the village, so what he did was he, he actually um, uh, tied a rope around its neck, you know, did a noose and tossed it around and pulled it, you know, because he couldn't get too close to the dog. And he tied it to the back of the vehicle and drove home. <laughs> When he got home, the dog was standing there, and I'll never forget the, the picture of it as a kid, seeing this, this dog that was, you know, our, our family pet, you know, and uh, we hadn't seen it for weeks, and it just wasn't the same dog at all, you know, anymore. It was emaciated, it was just, it was a mess, you know, and it was exhausted from having trotted all the way back for some kilometres behind the vehicle. And um, so then um, it's just standing there in the middle of the you know, this big open space in the middle of the mission station. So Dad walks inside and brings out the rifle. Of course, I'm a, I'm a kid, I'm seven or eight years old, you know, and I'm saying, no, don't kill it, you know. But there was only one solution for the disease of that thing, and that was to kill it. Now, we live in such a uh, sanitised world today, you know. So I'm sure that most of you would not have witnessed your father loading the gun and going bang and the dog falls down and that's the end of it. But I learnt something and I've revisited this many times. Do you know, we have an ability to kill things because they're disease ridden and they will, their disease will damage us if they don't die. If that dog had bitten me, I would have got rabies. It had to die for my sake. For the sake of my mother, my father, my sisters. That dog had to die. Do you know, that this man had an encounter with Jesus and fell down like a dead man. An encounter with the king causes things to die in us. It causes something about us to die which allows other things to live. Isn't that good? Yeah. Do you know, we need to get out the gun and shoot our rabid dogs. <laughs> How's that for a picture? But you hear what I'm saying this morning? Because if we do, we're going to live, we're going to be released to live in the Spirit like never before. And if we truly encounter Jesus, then stuff that, can't, that shouldn't be alive in us can no longer live. But we live in him, and he lives in and through us. Isn't that awesome? Don't forget, this man's in exile on an island, isolated, living in a cave, and this is where his life is. How does he live? He lives in the Spirit. Who's leading him? The Holy Spirit is. What is he like? He's a man of the Spirit. And in encountering the king, he becomes like a dead man. But if we become like dead men, then we really live. And this life in the kingdom depends on death to self, death to sin, but alive to him. Yeah? Alive to him. Do you know, out of this came the great revelation that was written after this. What great stuff can come from our lives if we'll live in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, be released in him so the Holy Spirit can have his way in and through our lives? What could God bring us into that perhaps we once had but have lost or that perhaps we didn't know was possible for the future. You know, it's got nothing to do with our age. You know, it's great seeing our young guys, you know, learning how to move in the spirit and getting out, you know, in the community and on the streets and touching people's lives with word of knowledge and stuff like that. But you know something? Most of us did that when we were young. <laughs> But it's, the Holy Spirit hasn't changed. 
And I feel that God's calling us as a people back to living in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being dead to things so that the life of the Spirit can be manifest through us. Amen? Yeah. Because if the life of the Spirit is flowing in us, it's going to change things everywhere we go. Yeah? Yeah. It's time for new rivers of life, I believe, to flow. You know, and time and time again, we keep coming back to this. But it's, you know, in the last, you know, the first half of this year, God's brought us so far, hasn't he, as a church? You know, what's flowing in the house now is just fantastic. You know, and um, th this is a great church. And it's because the love of God is here and the peace of God and the joy of God is here and so on. And because we, we want what he wants, you know. And I said to the, at the last leaders lunch, I said, you know, I, I want us to be a church that Jesus wants to be a part of. <laughs> because if we're a church that Jesus wants to be a part of, then he's going to build it. And he's going to build it his way. And he's going to do it in and through us. But if we uh, have this mixture of flesh and spirit and the battles that go on all the time as a result, then he, he, he's limited in how he can build in and through us. But if we'll say, well, okay, it feels like I'm living in a cave on a, you know, exiled on an island, but I'm going to be in the spirit. I'm going to choose to be a person of the spirit. I'm going to choose to be led by the spirit. I'm going to choose to have the life of the spirit flowing in me. Amen? Then things are going to be different. Come on, let's all stand together in his presence this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just close our eyes and keep our hearts open to the Spirit of God. Oh Lord, we thank you that we see the, the theology in Romans 8, but we see the outworking of it in Revelation 1. We thank you, Lord, for John, whose simple statements point to so much for us. And Lord, we thank you that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the Spirit, the Spirit of life, has set us free from the law of sin and death. Lord, we thank you that it's a done deal. And we're simply to walk by faith in it, appropriate it in our lives. And so, Lord, as we stand in your presence, we thank you that there's no condemnation, but instead we can come boldly into your presence. We can come confidently because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free. It has set us free from the law of sin and death. Do you know, we can be dead people, but alive in him because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free. Amen. Why don't you... Acknowledge that to the Lord this morning. Just say, Lord, I thank you that you have set me free. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free. I can be one who lives in the spirit, who's led by the spirit, and who has the life of the spirit flowing in and through and from us. Hallelujah. Oh, Holy Ghost, this morning, as we stand in your presence, Lord, I know that you're probably speaking to some of us about some things that need to die. But God, I pray this morning that we'll catch a revelation of how to live in you. How your life can flow more unhindered in our lives. How the life of the Spirit can be released and manifest in our lives in greater measure than ever before. God, speak into our hearts. Open our minds, I pray. Enlighten us this morning. Let revelation flow. Hallelujah. God, as we look forward in you, help us to see with the eyes of the Spirit. Help us to see what you see. Help us to see with eyes of faith. 
Hallelujah. Oh, God. And as we seek to live in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit, let your life flow. Let a new dimension of life flow. Oh, God, let it not only flow here on a Sunday or other meetings through the week, but let it flow when we're at work, when we're running our businesses, when we're touching people in the community, when we're at the sporting field or wherever we might be, oh, God, when we're in, the, in a restaurant or whatever area of life we might be, and let your life flow, let the life of your spirit flow because it's your spirit of life that set us free. And so, Holy Spirit, we want you to be free to, to flow in us and through us and from us to touch other people's lives. Let new rivers of life Life flow from us, I pray, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, all over again, we want to discover how to live the kingdom way. How to live out this kingdom that is contrary from the things of this world. Oh, Lord, so that we will have life to give to others like never before. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.